The scripture today is from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. It's in your pew Bible on pages 115 and following. Hear the word of the Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Jebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom, whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belt to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Tom. It's good to have the deadly duo back together again since the cantata. I will be speaking from the pulpit today and not from the center as Cliff normally does, um, simply because I am recovering from knee surgery and shingles, and I need something to hang on to because I'm not terribly steady. Some would say I'm never terribly steady. <laughs> will you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And uh, through me or in spite of me, may we who are called to be your people hear the word you long for us to hear. Amen. Today's scripture from the Gospel of John is kind of like a pizza with everything on top. Did I make you hungry yet? <laughs> well, I won't tell you my college experience of the first time of pizza with everything, 
that you can just imagine. But try trying to figure out what each item is if you didn't know what everything included. And so today's scripture is somewhat like the everything on top of a pizza. I'm only going to scratch the surface because it would take about a semester of class time to go through all of the items in this gospel. So the first part of it I want to talk about is John's use of numerology. John is very attentive to the symbolism of numbers in his gospel. So the first number is the number seven. The seven disciples, five are named, two are not. Aren't you glad you're not the two that weren't even named in the gospel? Seven disciples. Seven is the number of divine completion or perfection. You might remember there are seven days in creation. There are how many colors in the rainbow? Seven colors in the rainbow. There are seven years in a Sabbath year from Leviticus. Seven lampstands, seven churches in Asia, seven seals on seven letters in Revelation, seven I am statements of Jesus in John's Gospel. If you have been attending Cliff's Bible study, you would already know that piece. The number seven is used over 800 times in the Bible. The early Bible, in fact, was divided into seven parts, law, history, poetry, prophets, gospels, epistles, and revelation. And so we have seven disciples fishing and then gathering with Jesus for breakfast. This is the symbol of divine completion as Jesus meets to give his final commandments to his disciples. Next is the number 153. Now, there are probably as many interpretations of the number 153 as there were foods on top of that everything on it pizza. Well, I like a couple of them. One is got a funny name. It's called the Tetragrammaton. Tetra from four, grammaton, number of letters. So there are four letters in Hebrew in the word Yahweh. We would transliterate that to Y H W H, no vowels are used, Y H W H. And that uh, symbol, that Y H W H, was used 153 times in Genesis. I like that. I like that symbol. Uh, the next is that, and here, any mathematicians in here? Math majors, physicists, a physicist. Oh, hallelujah. I wasn't seeing any hands go up with that. So the sum of the first 17 integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, those are integers. The sum of the first 17 integers is 153. The 17 is a triangular number. Now, don't try to make it 17 twist and turn to fit into it. A triangular number is one who, that forms an equilateral triangle when you put the base at 17, then go 16, 15, 14, and so on, all the way up to one. It forms an equilateral triangle. Equilateral triangle. Therefore, it's called a triangular number. Um, a triangular number, as I said, is an equilateral triangle, which each, uh, each side adds up to the number 17, if we're using 17. So 17 to one, 17 to one on each side will still add up. Uh, to the number 17. And in the uh, Bible, uh, symbolism and numerology, 17 equals the Ten Commandments and the seven spiritual gifts, or the balance of law, Ten Commandments, and grace, the seven spiritual gifts. So there you get 17, multiply that out, and you come up with 153. A simpler uh, explanation for 153 is that it's a huge quantity of fish, and the net that Jesus commanded the seven to toss into the sea did not break with a large quantity of fish, which tells us that Jesus never loses a fish. Even if there was 154, which would mess up symbolism for John, <laughs> the fish would not break. Once redeemed, we can never get away from Jesus. 
153. You can play with those and look up 153 on the internet and come up with some of the other explanations. Some are maybe and some are really wild. And then the number three. So let me ask you, in the Bible, have you seen the number three anywhere? Uh, like where? Trinity. Trinity. Actually, that's not in the Bible, but it's a good answer. Where else? Three wise men, excellent. Where else? Say it out loud. On the third day, he rose from the dead. Absolutely terrific. Good, you're getting some of them. What else? Yeah, the Trinity, good. What else? Yeah, the three questions of Peter, do you love me? What did Jesus do after he was baptized? He went where? Into the wilderness and? For 40 days and 40 nights. I'm working on threes, not forties. What else? What happened there? <laughs> what is it? Yes. Three temptations. Right. Oh, good. You're doing well. How many disciples were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Three. Name them. Oh, sorry. Part B. <laughs> How many women at the cross? Three. How many days did Jesus spend at the tomb? And you've got the Holy Trinity, which, by the way, is inferred in the Bible, but never mentioned by name. So that's just an introduction to numerology. Don't get freaked out by it. I'm not suggesting that you become a numerologist and abandon Christian faith. But there's symbolism in threes. By the way, those of you who like to use the number 666, it's not a duplicate of 333. The number 666 refers to Nero, the emperor and not to the devil at all in Revelation. Another story. Okay, the second part of, um, uh, of this whole section of John is about calling and recalling people. So the first time we see Jesus walking along the lakeshore, it's recounted in all of the Gospels, um, Jesus calls people from their fishing, right? Calls them out of their boats, leave their nets, follow him. So it's a calling of the disciples. There are um, four who are fishermen, and two, Philip and Nathaniel, who simply are walking along the road. And then from their offices, Matthew and Levi. And you know, I've been preaching for 37 years. That's the first time I realized that Matthew and Levi were actually sitting in offices when Jesus called them. I don't know how many of you already knew that, because it surprised me. Four of them, we don't even know where they were. We just find them appearing a little bit later on. But Jesus is calling, calling us to come and follow him. Luke and John both recount fish stories. In Luke's story of bringing in the fish, the two, uh, two boats are there, and the nets are starting to tear as they're bringing the fish into the boat. Um, the, the boats represent two things, and there's nothing in any of those scriptures that don't have a symbolic meaning as well as a literal meaning. So the boats in Luke's story are the narcissistic ego, the inner self, the ego, and the relational and spiritual aspect of our being. So we have the practical, physical, egoic, and then the spiritual side. So we have two boats side by side trying to do the work by themselves, and the nets are breaking. And they haul some fish um, into the boat. Only after they had been awake all night, getting no fish, and Jesus gives them a commandment. He says, go out deeper. Now, going deeper with Jesus is not just about getting to the middle of Galilee, where it might be a mile and a half deep, but going deeper with Jesus means going deeper with Jesus. Okay, got that one. I don't have to explain that anymore. Um, in John, uh, Jesus commands the disciples to cast their nets on the right side of the boat. Now, we often think of that as starboard. A lot of fisher folk around here, so the right side, we would never say go off the right side of the boat. We'd say go to starboard. And on the left side would be the port side. But going to the right can also mean going to the correct side. So I want you to imagine for a moment, I'm gonna move, move away from this just a moment. If you are right-handed, how many of you are right-handed? How many of you are in your right minds? <laughs> there we go, gotcha. Um, if you are right-handed, which most people back then had to be whether they were or not, 
When you're gathering a net to throw it overboard, you're picking it up and your right hand is the throwing hand and the left hand is the guiding hand. That's where you're getting your strength to throw the nets. Now, Jesus is saying, go and cast your nets on the correct side, which means you have to change everything you've thought about. If you're right-handed and you're throwing off the right side, it works easily. If you're right-handed and you're throwing off the left side or the port side of the boat, you've got to put your strength in your left hand and use your right to guide. And try doing that sometime. That's a little tougher. If you are shoveling your garden, for example, and you're used to putting your right foot on the shovel, you pick it up this way and toss it. Switch feet. I've had to do that with my knee this time and shovel it the other way, and it feels really weird. So Jesus is telling the disciples to go out and throw your nets to the other side of the boat, the right side, and that's where they found the 153 fish. The net did not break, and Jesus said, come follow me, follow my directions. Get used to knowing that my directions will get you to the best possible place. Well, we move into the next part of this, uh, this text, and this is where we look at communion. You remember the Last Supper? Jesus took what? Bread, right? So far, so good. And when he had given thanks, he then what? Broke it. I forgot, he blessed it first. Then broke it, and then gave it to them. And then after the dinner, the, the after dinner cup, now he didn't break the cup, okay? Not this time. But he lifted it for thanks, and then he gave it to them. And so along Emmaus Road, he meets with some disciples on Easter night, and chatting with them along the way, they kind of missed the boat, literally. <laughs> they were going on the Emmaus Road, doesn't go down near the water. And you'll get that joke in a little bit. <laughs> um, and they didn't get it until when? They sat down to dinner with Jesus, and what did he do? Right. Blessed it, broke it, gave it. And they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. So another communion event. By the way, let's go to the next one. Where else did Jesus people, uh, feed a lot of people? Exactly. Just after that, he uh, we, uh, it was actually a little after that, where he went out and he had people sit down in large, 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 large groups. By the way, it says 5,000, and you missed the not counting women and children. Probably more like 15,000 people were gathered. That's a lot of people. That's almost all of the people in Israel at the time. So they wanted you to know it was a lot of people that Jesus was going to feed. He fed the multitude, and that's the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four Gospels. That means it's important, right? So this is another communion event with Jesus. Um, he fed the multitude. I suspect that he took the bread and the fish. Now, it seems to me that for the number of times Jesus used bread and fish are more times than he used bread and wine, that fish ought to be the third component if we're doing our three numerology. We should be serving fish uh, maybe some um, a smoked salmon or something, along with bread and wine on the table, but we don't do that yet, someday. So um, he, he sits down, has them sit down, he breaks the bread, breaks the fish, hands it out to them, and there's 12 baskets of bread left at the end of that meal. Now, I'll let you play with the number 12, because you'll find all sorts of meanings for that, too, as you think about it. They recognized him, even there, in the breaking of the bread. And now we come to the story in John where it's daybreak. Look at the symbol of daybreak. What's happening at dawn? What do you see in the lower, beneath the horizon? Darkness. What do you see above the horizon? Light, right. So Jesus is bringing light out of darkness gathered along, by the way, a stony shore. If you think you're going to a beach along Galilee, you're going to the wrong lake. There's no sandy beaches. Um, having been there, you'll know that. And uh, I'm telling you that so you don't make that mistake in the future. Um, the, along the stony beach, out of the darkness, into the light, 
Jesus invites them to come to breakfast. They cast their nets, they've got some fish. He brings them to the charcoal fire and joins some of their fish with his. Now, we could just kind of skim over that because we know he's already got fish frying on the fire. He's already got bread there, probably some wine. Yeah, they drank wine at breakfast, so if you do your parties, don't feel embarrassed. Um, so he takes their fish and joins it with his, which tells us that everything we bring to Jesus is blessed. Whatever gift we can offer, when he puts it together with what he brings, everything is multiplied and able to be shared. Don't miss that little statement that he took their fish and added it to his. And so he blessed the bread, gave it to them, he joined their fish, he blessed the fish, broke the pieces of fish and gave it to them. Everything blessed, broken, and given to feed the multitudes. Which brings us to the third part of this story, which is the commission. Breaking bread, breaking fish, breaking food to feed the multitudes. And here we see Jesus taking Peter aside. This is one of the most poignant pieces of all scripture, I think. I mean, I like Peter. He's not only got a foot in his mouth most of the time, he's often just changing feet. Uh, I don't know how he manages to circumnavigate. But he is there with Jesus, and you know what happened. Somebody over here said it before, the three denials of Peter uh, about Jesus just before the crucifixion. Here we get Jesus taking Peter aside for three questions. Peter, Peter, do you love me more than the others do? It's like, do you love me more than these? It's kind of a nebulous thing, but the, the statement, the question means, do you, Peter, love me, Jesus, more than anybody else here loves me? Now, get with this question because, remember, who's the beloved disciple? Not Peter, it's who? John, exactly. But he's asking Peter, do you love me more than anybody else here loves me? Whoa, here's a change of power. And Peter says, yeah. And so Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Lambs, the little ones, the baby sheep. Jesus, Peter is to feed the baby ones. They're the easiest ones to care for. You could stick a bottle in their mouth or take them to the mother's breast and the babies will take from that. They are like sponges. When you tell them God is love, one simple three word phrase, they go out from Sunday to God is love, God is love, God is love. They've got it like that. Feed the babies, feed my lambs. Take care of the little ones first. And then Jesus comes back at Peter a second time. Peter, do you love me? Really, do you love me? Tend. Now in the version that was on the, on this, uh, the screen, it wasn't quite the way the original scriptures intended. Tend, tend my sheep, take care, minister to them, watch over them. Attend to them. Watch over, take care of, attend. A little harder than just feeding lambs. Now you've got to be a shepherd. You've got to take care of all of the ones who will come into your fold. And then finally, the third question. Peter, I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you really, really, truly, deep down forever, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, <laughs> Jesus, I just told you that I do. You know that I love you more than anything else in the whole wide world. And now he gets the toughest assignment. If that's true, Peter, then feed my sheep. Did you ever try to feed, feed an adult? Now, if you have taken care of an elder parent, or if you've worked uh, in a hospice facility or in a hospital, Sometimes you need to feed someone who is not able to use their hands or their mind and feed themselves. My, my dad died two years ago from Alzheimer's and in the last few weeks he was not able to remember to feed himself. And as his caregiver that fell to me to do, which I lovingly did, but it got harder and harder. He happened to love soup 
which is one of the hardest things, to get into a mouth when the chin is down. Feed the adults. That's on the literal level. But on the spiritual level, feed my sheep. Give the unbelievers the basics and give the believers solid teachings. We should not need to keep rehearsing God is love, God is love, God is love with grown-ups who are believers. That should already be a part of our verbal repertoire as believing people. Show Christ's love in your body by what you do. And Jesus said to Peter, you will indeed, because when you're older, you're going to go where you don't want to go. People will put a belt around you like a slave and carry you away, and you will be crucified the same as I have been crucified. Yes, Peter, show your love for Jesus in your body. These are three questions of love and commitment that redeems Peter from his three denials. Get that balance? Three denials, three questions of love and commitment. I love this chapter and I love this verse because it tells me that no matter how many times we mess up, Jesus is going to come and ask me that question, ask you that question. Ginny, do you love me? Marcus, do you love me? Judy, do you love me? Kathy, do you love me? Do you love me? And I get the chance to say, oh, Jesus, I do. I really messed up, but I still love you. And he's going to say to me once again, then go and do what I've asked of you. Over and over again, it's just amazing that Jesus continues to allow us to feel that experience of forgiveness. These were three questions asked of a lapsed disciple to finally turn away from his old self of fish fishing and turn now to people fishing, searching for others to bring into Christ's fold. Well, that's the Bible, that's the scripture, but what does that mean for us today? First, in calling. What is Christ calling you from? And what is Christ calling you to? What is Christ calling you from? What is Christ calling you to? I know when I first got the call to ministry, ordained ministry, I was a practicing nurse professional. I was teaching nursing. I thought it was at the pinnacle of my career. I was the head instructor at a major medical center. My pastor said, Ginny, I think you're called to preach the gospel. And I said, no, Jock, I've already got a career. I don't need another one. I didn't know about second career people back then. That wasn't even a term that they used in those days. I'm not trained for that. Another excuse that we use. Uh, Christ doesn't call the gifted. Christ gifts the called. Christ doesn't give us the answers to all the questions. Christ gives us the answer to the question at hand that we might be faithful in the moment. So many of us want to see the future, don't we? We want to know, will we have enough funds to take the cruise? Will our health hold out until our grandchild or great-grandchild's wedding? Will we learn to be a musician like Marcos. I suspect the answer to that is no for most of us, but there are at least two or three in our congregation for whom that answer will be yes. Christ calls us from where we have been sitting for Levi, the, the lawyer. Oh golly, Jesus called a lawyer. Wow. From his office and said, Levi, you've been practicing law, now I want you to practice grace. Come follow me. Even if you've never given a public address before, Christ will empower you when the moment is ready. Calling. What old habits do we need to leave behind? Only throwing our nets off of the port side of the boat? Starboard side of the boat? not throwing our nets out of the boat at all, trying to do casting fishing or worm fishing when you really need a net because of the size of the fish. 
We've never done it that way before. Seven last words of the church, and that is not divine completion. What old habits do we need to leave behind? Trying one more time, even when exhausted. Wow, many of us can relate to that. I just can't get through to that kid. Oh, not mine, they've been great. I just can't get through to that kid. I cannot get the nail and the hammer to meet at the right place, and it's either my thumb or a bent nail that's going in. If you've ever worked on a Habitat house, you've probably said that. And trusting that Jesus is alive and might show up anywhere and anytime, even here, our calling. Secondly, our communion. And here's a key one. Do we expect something miraculous every time we share Christ's body and blood, the bread and the cup? Or do we come down because it's a habit and we do it all the time and we come and we have our prayer, but we figure that's it? Do we expect something miraculous every time we commune with Christ? Oh my goodness, communion with Jesus here and now. Would it be different for you if Jesus himself stood behind that table? Uh, guess what? Jesus himself stands behind that table every communion. It doesn't matter what it looks like. That's Jesus standing up there, inviting us to share his body and his blood. Do we see Jesus in the taking, in the blessing, in the breaking, in the giving? Do we give thanks? By the way, that's the real meaning of Eucharist that some churches use. Do we give thanks in every meal of bread, fish, wine, hot dogs? Oh, I'm sorry, that just slipped out. Fish, bread, wine, do we give thanks in every meal we share? Not just in here, not just in Radcliffe Hall, but in every meal we share, do we give thanks that Jesus is there with us, has been the provider of the fact that we have food, and that when we share it with others, we can share it with others? Do we give thanks for that? Our communion. And then here's the tough part, our commission. Do you love Christ enough to feed the little ones? Question one. To give them basic instruction and examples of how a Christian lives? To find ways to include them in all of your life? To include them at the grown-up table? To talk to them on their level of understanding? And for those of you like me, who live in a 55 plus community, do you seek out little ones to feed the word of God? Do you love Christ enough to take care of, minister to, watch over the older ones, to minister to the older ones in your family, even the belligerent ones, to watch over the ones in the congregation? Yep. Accepting a leadership role when the nominating committee calls you. Ooh. To attend to the ones in the community and the world, giving time and talent as well as your gifts. And do you love Christ enough to show Christ in your body? To maintain a healthy lifestyle. That's, sorry folks, diet, exercise, Laughter. Don't forget that the really important, one of the really important parts of a healthy body is laughing. Yeah, Kathy's nodding because you know that, being ill yourself lately. You know, laughter is the best medicine is absolutely true. Laughter. The smile takes a lot fewer muscles to smile than it does to frown. Healthy lifestyle. To pray without embarrassment to share the depth of your faith with others, to let your faith be worn on your sleeve as well as your face, to seek those who are without a firm faith footing and offer them Christ. That is a very contemporary understanding. It's an E word like email. It's called E 
evangelism, to seek those who are without a firm faith footing and offer them Christ. Do you love Christ enough to feed the little ones, to tend the big ones, and to feed the big ones? Along the lakeshore, from the office, in the marketplace, even in the back pews of the church, Jesus calls us to, compute, to join him, to commune with him, to pick up the mantle of his ministry, and then he reminds us to come, follow me. Amen. <laughs>